nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. Okay, so here, here's what we're going to do. We've got two classes here. I'm going to hand out some notes for everyone to get you oriented with things. Um, and, and, and it may have seemed strange to some of you as to what was going on with this idea of having two classes in the same room at the same time. And maybe I'll, I'll be able to explain that a bit better. Um, if you are registered, take a handout. If you are not registered, come see me and we'll talk about it and leave a handout because I don't know that I, I printed enough. But what we're doing here is we're having two classes. One's called MSE 582 and it's going to go for the first 10 to 12 lectures, all right? And the idea of that class is that everyone who takes that class will get on a microscope, will learn how to install a sample into the microscope, align the microscope, take a picture, right? So that at the end of that, you can take your own samples, put them in the microscope, and take a picture. You will have very little idea as to the underlying theory, all right? I'll teach a couple of theory lectures at the end of 582, all right? But that is what the content is of 640. So if you're signed up for 582 and all you want to do is learn how to take a simple picture, you're in the right thing, right? If you want to go beyond that and learn the theory to things, that's what the rest of the semester is about, all right? So I anticipate some of you all at the end of 582 saying thank you very much and not showing up anymore, and others of you saying, hey, I want to know more and I'll take 640. So that's why there's two classes, um, right? The goal within the 582 section of the class is literally just to make sure that you have the skills necessary to run the machine. And we're going to do this in a couple of, of uh, short units, the first of which is the operation of the TEM. Um, and then we'll look at the end into diffraction imaging and spectroscopy and just uh, basically a lecture piece on diffraction imaging and spectroscopy, OK? And then with uh, this, it's simply pass-fail. There's a simple uh, sample that you insert into the microscope. You take the image that's required of you at half a million times magnification without stigmation and proper focus nothing to it, right? And then you pass. What you'll find is it'll take you several times on the microscope to learn how to do all that. Um, and both Bong Joon and I and other graduate students can help you make sure that you learn how to do that appropriately, OK? Also, we will write up a laboratory uh, associated with this that ends up forming your user manual. And so at the end of the whole thing, you'll have a user manual that you know, a year and a half from now, when you go, oh, yeah, I need to take those TEM pictures, you can go back to and remember what you were doing um, because sometimes that's really what happens a lot with the people in the 582 section is they start off and then they go and do other experiments and find later that they need it, okay? Um, I, I, I throw this usually in here so you know why I'm teaching this. Um, the only thing I do in my life is do transmission electron microscopy, okay? So I have uh, someone who did a PhD solely focused on TEM. Um, I then went to work at a place called the National Center for Electron Microscopy. Um, which is a TEM-specific center run by the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. I was there for six years and then moved here to Purdue. So my uh, experience is just literally in this. I know nothing else, all right, in terms of things, all right? So that I'm kind of, that's why they have me teach this. In particular, I have uh, kind of research efforts in crystal defects, crystal growth, uh, mechanical behavior, and electronic thin films, all using TEM as the primary tool. So that's why I'm your instructor in this, okay? Um, and then what I want to do uh, from here for the rest of this lecture is give you an overview as to what the TEM can do, right? And none of this will be too much in detail, but at later points you can remind yourself, oh yeah, that's what he talked about on the first day, okay? And that'll give you a sense of it. All right, so um, what we're going to do here is start off with an overview as to what you can do with the transmission electron microscope. The idea is that we can see um, how this machine is used before we start to understand the workings of it. Um, primarily what I want to do over the next short period is describe the types of data that come out of the machine simply by showing a number of images um, and giving you a sense as to how you might utilize this technique um, to provide information about your own samples. Okay, So that's the, the goal of what we want to accomplish with the rest of this lecture today. Um, so the primary uh, first thing that we're going to deal with when dealing with the transmission electron microscope is the TEM as a diffraction tool. Um, the underlying principles of the microscope evolve around the fact that as you bring high 
uh, velocity electrons into a TEM sample, have them pass through the sample and come out the other side. They interact with the atomic arrangement of atoms within the sample. They scatter, and they will scatter in a coordinated fashion if you have a regular array of those atoms, and that leads to diffraction. So much like um, X-ray diffraction that I'm sure most all of you are familiar with, you can also get electron diffraction as a way to find out about the crystal structure of your sample. Um, when doing material science studies, looking at the crystal structure is a primary piece of information about the microstructure. You want to know what is the crystal nature, how do we formally describe that, how do we determine that, and diffraction is the primary technique that we use throughout the field of material science to do that. In the case of the electron microscope, we're using incident electrons. We're relying on the wave nature of the electrons to give coordinated scatter to particular angles, and then we use that to form diffraction patterns. This is a diffraction pattern here shown on the right-hand side of this view graph, taken from um, a very complicated electronic thin film of gallium nitride grown on sapphire. This was an attempt by a crystal grower to control the growth of gallium nitride to achieve two different phases, the hexagonal gallium nitride phase and the cubic gallium nitride phase. In each case, what you're seeing with these spots is you are seeing electrons that have come through the sample scattered to a particular angle, that angle being determined by Bragg's law, which we'll go through and understand in detail um, in the rest of the class. And those angles then give you information about the plane spacings and the atomic arrangements within the crystal. And so by an analysis of this pattern on the right-hand side, we can determine a number of things. We can determine that the material has both the cubic and hexagonal phases. It turns out that the arrangements tell us that there are actually two different orientations of the cubic phase with respect to the hexagonal phase. These long streaks that we see in the pattern indicate that there's extensive twin defect formation. And really, everything about the crystal structure is revealed within this diffraction pattern other than the spatial location of these, OK? So everything that you would want to know about the crystal structure shows up in the diffraction event. It forms the core of how the microscope works, and it forms the core of basically eight or nine lectures within the 640 portion of the class. Um, with this, then, we can, again, distinguish and identify crystalline and amorphous phases of materials. And then on top of that, Using the microscope, we are able to select different regions of this diffraction pattern to form an image, OK? And so what we will do is form an image either with the directly scattered electrons or with electrons that diffract to particular angles. And from that, that image will give us additional spatial information about where the different crystallographic defects or crystallographic phases are located within our sample, OK? So diffraction forms a primary part of how the TEM is used to give us information, OK? Um, there are other variants on diffraction that we will also go into right at the end of the class. Um, but I want to show these to give you a, a sense of the additional power of this technique. One is called convergent beam electron diffraction. Here, instead of taking diffraction from the broad, array, uh, broad area of your sample, you instead focus the electrons down to a very fine point with the converged angle on them. And then you get a very different looking pattern. This is a beautiful pattern. Um, I forget where I've stolen this. And so, uh, Joe, I'll note that, because I want to have all attributions on these things. Um, I steal things pretty readily. Um, but this is a convergent beam electron diffraction pattern. You will note that it looks remarkably different than that one there. But it also gives us a lot of additional information. Um, it turns out that the symmetries present in this pattern um, can be used to describe the point and space group of the crystal that we are looking at. The point and space group are the formal crystallographic mechanisms of describing a phase. So with this type of diffraction event, we can classify the space group and point group that a material belongs to. Also, looking at these fine lines that are present within the central disk of this convergent beam pattern, if we measure very small shifts in those, we can correlate, correlate those with local strain in the sample. So with the TEM, we are able, able to measure lattice strains on the order of um, one part in 1,000, which is pretty good, OK, um, at a spatial resolution you know, of order several nanometers. It is unique as a technique in that mode. Um, additionally, if you have a very small structure, 
by converging the beam to a small probe size, again, on the order of nanometer or so, you can determine the diffraction. Um, uh, uh, the, you can see the diffraction pattern from a very small region, and again, determine crystallographic information from individual things on the nanometer size. Again, that is unique to the TEM. It provides a nice complementarity in materials research to X-ray diffraction, which gives you broad information. You can go through then with the TEM and on the nanoscale, find out what are the different constituents of that broad scale information. So this is something we'll get into at the end of the class, okay? There's an additional technique that's um, an unusual one that we'll also touch on briefly called large angle convergent beam diffraction. And this one is used um, to do some more esoteric types of research, but you can look at, for example, misorientation across grain boundaries. You can look at uh, dislocation Berger's vectors by using this. This is the fault vector for a line defect in a crystal. And again, this large angle convergent beam pattern gives you information about crystalline symmetry. So with the TEM, selected area diffraction happens all the time, we see it as a primary mode of experimental work within the TEM. And then these two things here, convergent beam diffraction and large angle convergent beam diffraction, form specialist techniques that can be added onto this and give us more information. Okay? Um, so when we go through and take our diffraction pattern, we do again find individual spots showing up from a crystalline material indicating that the electrons are diffracting to a given angle as defined by Bragg's law. What we can do subsequent to obtaining that diffraction pattern is we can take images. This here is a bright field image um, taken from a layer of silicon germanium grown on silicon. Um, you'll see lots of examples of this in this class because it's something that I work on. But what we're seeing here is we're seeing a pretty large area of about a micron and a half by a two and a half microns here. It looks like my scale bar didn't show up. Um, but what we're seeing here is these black lines representing the presence of individual dislocations within the sample and the clear regions here representing regions of perfect crystal within the material. This is called diffraction contrast imaging. These images are formed by obtaining contrast from particular features within the sample that are diffracting differently than the bulk of the sample. And so the idea is that we go back to these diffraction patterns, we utilize in the microscope a small aperture, basically a metal plate with a small hole, and we place that around either the direct beam or one of the diffracted beams, and then use just that beam to form the image. And what this yields is it yields an image where particular regions of the crystal that are strongly diffracting either out of that direct beam or into the diffractive beam that we've chosen are what form the image. In the case of a dislocation, the idea is that local to this individual line defect, there is strain due to the termination of the lattice plane at this point, and that local strain diffracts the electrons differently and is what gives us the presence of scatter, say, outside of the aperture in the case of a bright field image or into the aperture in the case of the dark field image. And so when we see these black lines on a white background, what we're seeing is local regions of defective crystal that are scattering differently and giving us different types of intensity into or out of that direct aperture that we've chosen. And again, we're able to spatially locate the defects in the sample. Um, the TEM really came into great wide scale use in the early 60s, um, largely with the groups at Oxford and Cambridge. And they applied this technique to looking at dislocation behavior in metals. Um, it was invented as a technique in around 1957 by Ernst Ruska. He won a Nobel Prize in the 80s for it, along with the fellows that invented the STM. Um, but really shortly thereafter, it found wide scale use as a way to describe dislocation behavior, as well as other types of defects and secondary phases within metals. And a lot of the advancements both in metallurgy as well as in TEM as a technique are interrelated in how we learn to image dislocations, stacking faults, grain boundaries, and the like in materials. This is still an important area of research. People are still using the TEM to do this type of work. And so we will have some significant emphasis in this class on understanding diffraction contrast imaging. And again, learning how to take appropriate images of dislocations, learning how to interpret 
uh, contrast from dislocation, uh, uh, dislocations of different types, learning how to interpret contrast from stacking faults and grain boundaries, and also trying to understand how different second phases and precipitates appear within a sample, both how they give different diffraction information, different spatial uh, distribution information from diffraction contrast imaging. So this is again a primary technique used in the field. Um, not only will we learn how to take images in say the bright field mode where we choose just the direct unscattered to first order electrons, we'll also learn how to take images in what's called dark field and also weak beam dark field imaging modes. And in this case, um, let me dim the lights here. Um, in this case, what we're doing is choosing different ways of orienting our crystal and choosing the diffracted electrons to improve our ability to see the defects. If you look at the image on the left-hand side and the right-hand side here, you are seeing black lines, again, on the left-hand side, representative of dislocations. On the right-hand side, you're seeing white lines, um, again, representative of those same dislocations. But if you look in this image here at the weak beam dark field image, you can see that the contrast is much sharper and much more distinct. And so when doing uh, diffraction contrast imaging, we will learn how to take the best type of images to give us the best information about the distribution of defects within our sample. Okay, and so this is again one of the primary experimental things we'll learn about as well as the theory behind this, okay? Um, another thing that you can do with the TEM is instead of choosing a simple uh, diffraction event by putting an aperture around say the transmitted or diffracted individual diffracted beams, if you have a sample that's very thin, and we'll talk about what that means, you can um, take and have <clears throat> the formation of an atomic resolution image. Here what you're doing is you're allowing the overlap of both the direct and multiple diffracted beams in your image. You are taking advantage of the fact that the diffracted beams undergo different wave phase shifts. And again, that's a big word, but we'll talk about what it means. And essentially what you're doing is forming an interference pattern. And that interference pattern carries within it information about the location of the atoms in the sample. And so on the upper right hand side of this image here, you see little white dots, both in two different grains, as well as here, the inclusion of a lead precipitate at this grain boundary between aluminum. And in each case, these white dots are representative of the location of atomic columns within that sample thickness. And so you can obtain images at very high levels of spatial resolution of the atomic positions within the sample. Um, in this case, it's a, a, an image taken um, at, a, at a, in a, in a special microscope called the Atomic Resolution Microscope that had a resolution on the order of two angstrom. It's about a 20-year-old image. These days, um, recent results are pushing this down even to the 0.5 angstrom regime. And so you're obtaining really high levels of image resolution to tell you where the atoms are located. Um, what we're going to do within the course of the class is learn when this type of imaging mode, the diffraction contrast mode, is preferable, and when atomic resolution is preferable. They each give you different types of information, and they need to be exploited in the right way. Um, these type of images are very popular. Um, you see a lot of them in journal articles to uh, tell you that, say, the, the person has synthesized a single crystal of something. Um, you'll learn why that's an inappropriate thing to use as a way to prove that, um, and you'll have a better interpretation of what these images are, are telling you in many journal articles. It's my experience that most people like high-resolution images because they are very pretty and very striking. Um, it's much more uh, uncommon to see them used appropriately to obtain real information about a sample. So I'm hoping that at the end of this class, you immediately go to diffraction and diffraction contrast first, before immediately thinking that atomic resolution is the thing that you need, okay? And that's just an opinion, but one that I'm right on. <clears throat> anyway, okay. Um, the other type of, uh, high, uh, of, of high resolution image is formed in what's called a scanning TEM. The idea here is that instead of relying on the overlap of transmitted and diffracted waves to form your image, you are instead going point by point with a highly focused electron beam focus down onto the angstrom scale, and you scan it back and forth across your image. And then when it hits an atomic position, 
It scatters, and when it's between atomic positions, it doesn't to first order, okay? And so you form an image where the white dots that you see represent the location of atoms along the projection of the crystal, okay? And this is called high angle annular dark field imaging. It's accomplished in the scanning transmission electron microscope. And again, we'll have a, <clears throat> a full lecture and a bit of a lab work to show how these types of images are formed. Um, as a point of full disclosure, I am not someone who does this. This is a fairly recently evolved technique. Um, we do now have a couple of graduate students that are getting pretty good at it. And so when this uh, lecture comes about, I may have a, a graduate student um, help me give this lecture now that he's more experienced than I am, okay? Um, this is a very powerful technique and uh, is finding increasing usage within the field. All right, <clears throat> you'll notice that I have a head cold and my, my throat's really given out on me, so I, I may stop pretty quickly here <clears throat> today. I really wanted to give this lecture, though. There's other really fancy things that you can do in the TEM, which we will not discuss in any detail at all, but I want to put them out there because they may be relevant to you, and you may find at the end of 640 you want to think about these things for your own research. You can do something called electron holography, and the idea of electron holography is you compare the phase shift between the electron as it passes through vacuum and as it passes through your sample, in this case a carbon nanotube, and the differences in phase show up in a hologram, and from that hologram you can actually map out the electric, electrical potential within the sample as a way to characterize the mean inner potential in a material. This is a very special experiment done by a fellow named John Cummings, where he was looking at field emission from a carbon nanotube inside of the TEM and mapping out changes in the field emission by using electron holography. Very fancy experiments, but I think you know something you can contemplate um, if you are doing something associated with electrical behavior within your sample. You can also use the TEM to look at magnetic structures. These are looking at different domains within a magnetic material, uh, courtesy of Greg Kuzinski. The idea here is that if you have an image that's in focus or specifically out of focus, the presence of these magnetic domains will deflect the electrons in different ways, depending on whether the, the spin's facing you this way or that, right? And so if you defocus or overfocus or underfocus is the correct way to say this, um, you can go through and find out maps of where the domains are located. There are even more sophisticated ways of measuring and imaging the magnetic behavior of a material. And so if you are someone who is looking at magnetic materials as we proceed in the class, let me know, and we can have additional lectures on this. It turns out that one of the primary people in the world doing magnetic imaging is a woman named Amanda Petford Long. She's up at Argonne National Lab right up the way. And so if anyone's doing magnetics, let me know, and I'll ask her to come down and give a lecture. I'm sure she'd be happy to, okay? I think it's interesting, and I wouldn't mind having that as an excuse, okay? Okay. All right. Additionally, not only can you take diffraction patterns and form high-resolution or diffraction contrast images, the fact that the electron is coming into your sample and scattering leads to the ability to do chemical information uh, recovery as well. There are two primary modes that you can do this. If you have an electron that's coming into your sample and it scatters inelastically, we'll describe what that means later, um, off of an atom, an X-ray can be admitted. All right? And if you put a detector close to your sample, you can actually count those X-rays, you can measure their energy, and from that you can determine what type of atom must have emitted that X-ray. The X-rays that come off are characteristic of the changes in the electronic structure that are present within an atom. So the idea is an electron comes in, knocks a uh, electron off of a particular atom. There's usually a associated shift of a higher energy electron down to that empty state. And the X-ray that comes off is characteristic of the difference in energy levels. And so if you have an appropriate spectrometer, you can count the number of X-rays at particular energies and use that to both qualitatively determine what the atoms are within your sample and with appropriate calibration, you can determine quantitatively how much of something is there, okay? So that's very powerful. So not only are we able to tell the crystal structure information as well as the defect information, as well as things like what's the grain size, we can also determine what's the composition down to on the order of 1% or so. You can do a little bit better if you work very hard, but if you have a 1% of something in something else, you can detect it and even quantify it using the TEM, okay? Spatial resolutions can be very low. 
on the order of a couple of angstrom. That's, that's generous. Usually on the order of a nanometer is about as good as you do. I think that's probably a bit too generous. Um, it depends on the sample, of course. Additionally, <coughs> pardon me, as the electron comes in and undergoes this inelastic scattering event to form these x-rays, it loses some energy. And at the bottom of the microscope, we have another spectrometer that can detect the amount of energy that it loses. And so again, we form a, a spectrum that has a number of counts on the y-axis, a particular energy loss on the x-axis, and these things are correlated with particular um, atomic species. And so you can again use this to uh, quant qualitatively determine what atoms are there, and with even more work, in this case, quantitatively determine what atoms are there. Interestingly, within the eel spectrum, you'll note that there's a lot of complicated shape. Looking at the calcium L edge here, you can see there's a sharp onset to this edge, and then a number of, you know, for lack of better word, squiggles thereafter, right? And those squiggles are determined, it turns out, by the density of states um, for the electrons to scatter into. And so what this means is that we can locally probe the electronic structure of a sample. And this gives us then information about the bonding characteristics of our material, a very, very powerful thing. An example taken here from uh, Seth Taylor, now at GE. He was doing a PhD research project at Berkeley when I was there where he was looking at particular grain boundaries in model oxides of titanium oxide. And the idea here is if you look at this edge onset, you see different shapes depending on the valence of the titanium atoms that are there, right? You see in the case of the T3 that there's just the two large humps. In the case of the T4+, plus, there's additional splitting within those, um, uh, those particular uh, states there. And so what this means is if you go through and experimentally determine that your spectra looks like this, you can determine that the valence of the uh, atoms must be something that's a four plus, because again, that's what you're seeing in reference spectra. And this is, again, just to give you an idea that the TEM can be used for lots of powerful things. Again, in this case, it's to look at bonding information, things like valence and the like, all right? One of the most powerful things um, that's being uh, really pushed in the field these days is the combination of this high angle annular dark field stem technique where we're doing atomic resolution imaging combined with eels. It turns out that the imaging mode and the acquisition of the eel spectra can be, they can be done at the same time. And so point by point, not only do you obtain a picture of where the atoms are, but you can obtain not only uh, spectra that tell you what the atoms are, but also their local bonding state. And that's incredibly powerful uh, and specialized type of work. Um, we have the capability of doing that here at Purdue. We also have access to national labs that do it even better. So if this is something of interest to your research, towards the end of the class, we can talk about how you can accomplish this, all right? Finally, in terms of chemical work, not only can you take these spectra and obtain a number of counts versus energy loss, the spectrometer has within it, a, uh, again, an aperture. It turns out it's a linear aperture, a slit, that lets you choose um, one particular region of the energy loss spectra from which to form images. <coughs> Pardon me. So what you can do is obtain images that spatially map out which type of energy loss events occurred. The one I'm showing here is from a silicon germanium uh, graded buffer structure. These are something that are used all the time nowadays in advanced computers. Um, you go from a silicon substrate that's 100% silicon and you gradually add in germanium until you create a strained layer of silicon on top of that that's pure silicon. And this is where the active region of your device is now. Um, this is something that's been developed for the past 15 years or so. And this is a cross section. And what you're seeing is in the pure silicon area, you have a lot of intensity. And as you grade with increasing germanium, the intensity decreases. In other words, spatially, we're determining that there's less and less silicon in each layer. Interestingly, with this image, you see that in between each layer, there's these strong white lines. Um, I got this sample from a colleague at IBM back when they were developing these technologies <coughs> to do some testing of the spectrometers with. And I showed him this image after the fact, and he said to me, wow, you weren't supposed to see that, right? Because in between each layer, they did a single uh, monolayer or two monolayers of silicon. And so it gives you a sense of the detectability. These are about two to three, I'm remembering off the top of my head, um, layers, atomic layers of silicon that you can detect between things. So it's a pretty interesting um, type of, of, of observation, all right? And again, 
It's just giving you a chemical map or distribution of the chemistry across your sample. All right? Okay. You can also do things dynamically. So it's, it's possible to uh, not only take pictures with your sample, but take pictures that have um, information about the dynamics of materials. This is, again, an example of dislocations in silicon germanium, now quite old. And you're looking at the motion of a dislocation through the sample and watching how it interacts with, say, another one. This is done um, during heating of a sample. It's possible to uh, heat your sample within the microscope and look at how different processes occur. Right? It's possible to do all sorts of things. It's possible to do all sorts of things. You can heat samples up to 1,300 degrees Celsius within the microscope. Okay? It's incredibly hot. You can cool them down to liquid nitrogen easily. You could cool them down to liquid helium with a lot of work. Okay? Um, and maybe liquid nitrogen is not that easy either. You'll ask Lior about that. That's his expertise. You can provide chemical fluxes in appropriate microscopes by inserting gases and having gases interact with your sample. Okay? We have one of those microscopes here at Purdue. You can come in and, and do things like STM type imaging or indentation of your sample. You can combine electrical bias with heating. You can strain, pull, push, poke, whatever um, on your sample and watch how things evolve. This is an entire subcategory of the field and one that I do as a, as a particular area. And so you know, I like to think and help people think of ways of doing these types of, of experiments. The idea here is that instead of just saying, huh, this is what my sample looks like, you can instead correlate that with the desired behavior and see how the different microstructural things are occurring during straining, during heating, and the like. Okay? Complicated types of experiments, but, but can be very fruitful. Okay, so that's my overview of, of how the TEM works. So the way that we're going to go and proceed with the class is as follows. <coughs> In MSC 582, we're going to learn how to use the microscope. Um, this is going to be about 10 to 12 lectures, depending on how I do. Um, what we're going to do is at the onset of this, we'll uh, discuss electron scattering uh, relatively briefly. We'll talk about what an electron is, go into wave-particle duality briefly, talk about how electrons scatter off of atoms. Then we're going to go through and talk about starting at the top and working our way down through the microscope. We'll talk about how our electron source works. That's an important thing because you need to get lots of electrons out of your source to use it appropriately. And so we'll go through and understand how the electron source works. Then we'll talk about lenses and their aberrations. It turns out that we have very bad lenses in the TEM. It's just because it's complicated to make a perfect magnetic lens. In fact, it's not possible. So we'll learn about how lenses work. We'll review optics. We'll discuss magnetic lenses and electrostatic lenses and their aberrations. And then after that, we'll talk about how the microscope goes together. It's in many ways similar to an optical microscope uh, from the way that the ray diagrams come together. There's a source in the optical microscope that would be light. In our case, it's electrons. There's a system of condenser lenses that take that electron source and put it down on your sample. There's a primary imaging objective lens. <coughs> What's complicated about the TEM is that objective lens has interactions with both the diffraction pattern as well as the image. That's different uh, than in the case of, an, of a standard optical microscope. And then there's a number of projector lenses that take that image out of the objective lens and magnify it. In a modern microscope, it turns out there's about four of these intermediate lenses and projector lenses that give you the up to you know, two million times magnification you might want. And so we'll go through and talk about how these lenses interact with each other, how the instrument goes together. We'll discuss alignment so that you learn how to put the electrons down through all the lenses in an appropriate manner and how to form the best quality image. And then we'll also briefly discuss samples and sample preparation. Every time I give this class and I get the feedback from this class, I'm always told <coughs> pardon me, that, that people wish they had more information about sample preparation. I could give a full semester class on sample preparation, and it varies very much from one type of sample to the other. People doing nanoparticles do very little more, usually, than distribute them in some ethanol and drop them onto a specially prepared grid. Right? People who are doing um, gallium nitride thin films grown on sapphire may use a special machine called a focused ion beam machine to prepare their samples. Um, there are other people that will want to do electropolishing of their metal samples. And it's all different. And so instead of giving a lot of detail, I will overview it. And then as people start to use the microscope, 
I'll instead work with them one-on-one -on -one so that they have more of a chance to get a specialized instruction, or I'll point them to a graduate student who does this all the time, who thus will know it better than I do now, right, so that you learn how to make samples appropriate for your work, okay? So it's just too much and, and not of interest to most people to learn all the details of sample preparation of the different types, but it's a crucial aspect to making good TEM images and, and using the machine well. So I don't want to do anything but, but emphasize that and give you some clues on how to go about this. But we will not talk a lot of lecture stuff about that, okay? Okay, in the 640 portion of the class, um, what we'll do then is move into theory. We'll review and get into more de detail on elastic and inelastic scattering. Um, and then from there, we'll build up a diffraction picture based on both single scattering and multiple scattering of electrons within the sample. We'll review and, and get more detail on Bragg's Law. We'll discuss the Lowy equations for diffraction. And we'll go through and talk about the uh, implications of having multiple diffraction events within the sample, so-called dynamical scattering. So that'll form a pretty healthy section of the class. We'll follow that with uh, details on image formation, both diffraction contrast and phase contrast, as well as this incoherent imaging in the stem. And then we'll wrap up the class with a couple of lectures, not too many, on EDS and on eels, uh, mostly because I'll run out of time, and I think that that can be reviewed in a couple of short lectures. Um, there's a lot of information in this. Um, one of the things that I'm hoping will happen out of taping these classes for the Nano Hub is I'm hoping at a later date, once this information is all up there, I can convince true experts in all of these areas to add additional, you know, six to ten lecture courses on them for your edification at a later point in time. So that's our goal within the, the, the framework of putting this up there, okay? All right, and I think there I'm going to stop, mostly because my voice is given out, all right? Um, so if you have any questions, let me know. And we'll start next time with a, a reminder of the basic properties of electrons and move on into electron scattering and the like, OK? Um, also, in terms of textbooks, um, the 582, there's that volume one of Williams and Carter. You really probably want to own it. You know, if you, if you don't have a lot of money and don't think you're going to use it a lot, you can skip it and borrow it from a friend. Um, in the case of the 640, I, I have given all four volumes. It's a great book. It's a wonderful book. It's one that it's good on your bookshelf. You'll use it a lot. You really will. And it's not too expensive because it's paperback, all right? For those of you all that are going to get into this pretty heavily, I'll, I've listed a secondary text, this one from Jim Howe. When you're older, when you've graduated from graduate school and you have more money, buy that book too, okay? It's a great book, all right? I have a second copy of that that's the second edition, or the first edition, because I got my new second edition for free in the mail. If you want to borrow that at some point and use it, you know, look at it, please let me know and I'll lend it out, okay? It should be on course reserve, I'll check also. Um, I learned my TEM from Jim Howe, the fellow who wrote that textbook. So the way that I'll present things is kind of a mesh between the two, which to me makes the most sense, all right? Um, it means that uh, the lectures will be more important than the text in terms of how you think about things, but the texts are there to help you. Um, again, this is all I've done for 15 years, so I have a pretty coherent framework about how I think about these things, and I hope I can convey it to you uh, well, all right? Yeah, so that's, other, that's kind of the mechanics of it. And great, look forward to, uh, to doing the rest of this, especially with a better voice, okay?